Some people enjoy playing themselves at cards or even chess. My passion is snakes and ladders. Playing with oneself can't be much fun, surely. Depends on who's around in the way of a partner. Fancy a game? This is about trying to connect truth with consciousness. Ah, the experience of a lifetime. Down you go. Merry meet. You're the Oracle? Bingo. Not quite what you were expecting, right? Well, then. If you are someone who is presently feeling stagnant, you're in the crossroads. If you are someone who feels the impetus to move forward, but don't know exactly how to move forward, you are in the crossroads. And if you're someone who has lifted their foot and it's hanging midair, unsure of where it is going to land, you are in the crossroads. And guess what? You're exactly where you should be. Be grateful that you are presently at a crossroads. The fact that you have arrived here tells me that you are ready to be an agent of change. You have searched for me across the desert on a camel. Through the gate of cancer, as moonlight upon water, you have found me. What you seek in me, you already know. You must approach my temple naked in spirit. If you approach me in humility and sincerity, I will be your muse and guide toward the crown chakra, where you will reunite with divinity and oblivion. It is only through separation that you will experience the bliss of reunified opposites. I reveal division. Though I am myself obscured between the polarity of one extreme and the other, between mercy and severity, you must choose the middle path which is all at once to me, by me, with me, and through me. I will show you that the only way to transcend division is to understand it. I am division, but also beyond it. These paradoxes are necessary and natural. From the division of two, comes all possibilities of the infinite numbers beyond it. Only some of my mysteries can be spoken, and for this I give you to the Hierophant. One of the anagrams of tarot is orat, which is, of course, the root of our modern English word orate, meaning to speak. In the Hindi language, orat means woman. In Old Persian, orat means female genitals. Herein is established the relationship between the priestess and the hierophant knowledge expressed by voice. The priestess is associated with the throat chakra and Venus and Da'at, which is the hidden 11th sphere of the Kabbalistic tree of life. Looking at the tarot trumps associated with the middle path, 
which is the experience of entering the goddess temple. We see that each of these major arcana are female. Manifest in the material world at bottom is the world. Above that is temperance, and far above that, across the immense desert and at the edge of the abyss, is the priestess upon Da'at. When the tree of life is superimposed on the human body, the priestess sits upon the throat. Da'at is composed of three Hebrew letters, Dalit meaning door, Ayin meaning eye or to see, and Tav meaning covenant or seal. The final 33rd vertebrae of the human spine or degree of initiation is in the throat and dot. Another association she has is Gimel, the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which means camel. The camel is the animal which you, the initiate, have symbolically journeyed with to arrive here at the temple of the mysteries. Kaba means stone. Stone is symbolic of that which is manifest. Kabbalah is therefore the stone of God. In the third century AD city of Palmyra, when the goddess Alat enters the city in a parade or procession to join the god Baal, she enters in a parade or procession accompanied before and after by female devotees or priestesses who were covered from head to toe in black. Why can't you see her? Because, like the Quran centuries later, she is hidden behind a rich red cloth or tent atop a sacred camel. Such camels were believed by Arabs, the Persian Magi, and other peoples of the desert to be guided by the invisible hand of God the essence of whom was invisibly concentrated in the little Kaaba or Kuba, the curtained shrine, on its back, to lead them to an oasis or other sacred place where there was water and shade, like Palmyra, the city of palms, or, as Rumi reminds us, to a sacred place like Mecca. Ancient Arab traders in desert caravans kept their sacred relics upon camelback enshrined in the same way. The goddess Allah and this tradition was before the god Allah. Her head, like the face on the crown in Kabbalah, is intentionally unseen. The cubed and red-tinted venerated object associated with her on the backs of sacred camels is also intended to be unseen, and goddess is paradoxically both unseen within as well as all the sky without or above. We can see a similarity to this in sacred relics of other traditions, such as the young maiden who bears the Holy Grail. To most spectators, the chalice which she carries is to be venerated, those with wisdom, however, know that it is but a ritualistic symbol and that the womb of she herself, the grail bearer, is the true holy grail. It is to be understood thoroughly that the word sais means to know and true knowledge or gnosis is intuitive and is the providence of the priestess this knowledge is both sexual and philosophical. Sais was also a small ancient city in Egypt along the Nile River. Herodotus tells us that this is the location of Osiris's grave and that his sufferings can be seen as a mystery upon a nearby lake at night. It is where Solon received the story of Atlantis, which he gave to Plato. It is here too that we find the famous inscription bearing the words of the goddess Isis. I am all that has been, 
and is and shall be and no mortal has ever lifted my veil iska is a word from the ancient persian avestan language meaning to want to desire to seek its root of is relates to the indo-european cognate of ais as in the name of the old egyptian town of sais meaning knowledge from this root we get the persian word ishq and the hindi word ishq both of which mean love love and knowledge are bound as alternating facets of the same inherent qualities of the priestess now if you are sitting comfortably i shall tell you why it's not be afraid to die ahead of you is a clearing in the trees and as you come closer you can make out an entrance to a temple there sat guarding the entrance is the most incredibly beautiful woman you have ever seen she wears a crescent moon upon her head for she is the daughter of the moon she is cancer the mistress of illusion keeper of secrets she is the egyptian goddess isis the queen of magic she is the high priestess her trump is too the teacher of the unseen brings in the nature of duality the essence of sexuality promises the potential of union for man she is all he has ever wanted and for woman she is the maiden that resides inside of us the seeds of femininity the woman's intuition her clear eyes shine like pools of the clearest depths the rest of her is veiled just like the backdrop behind her and you know on speaking you are to respect her silence respect her space just be her gown decorated with pomegranates show the ripeness of feminine seeds in her lap she holds a script marked torah the scroll of the law which also stands for rota meaning wheel and taro meaning laws of the universe she sits between the two pillars of severity and mercy one black one white representing the duality of nature and nothing comes into being without union of duality as you sit before her your childlike curiosity overtakes you and although you sense it's wrong you cannot help but ask to see behind the veil she looks deep into your soul and you instinctively know that the way to see is to be silent and go within as you do so you feel her speak to your soul these secrets are limited by the realm of words but you have come here to seek growth and from now on i shall share with you the secrets listen to the silence and you will always hear me look for me in your dreams and you will always see me validate the magic of coincidence and you will always feel me The man who loves his own opinions and fears to part with them, who suspects new truths, who is unprepared to doubt everything rather than admit anything on chance, should close this book, for him it is useless and dangerous. He will fail to understand it, and it will trouble him, while if he should divine the meaning, there will be a still greater source of disquietude. If you hold by anything in the world more than by reason, 
truth and justice, if your will be uncertain and vacillating, either in good or evil, if logic alarm you, or the naked truth make you blush, if you are hurt when accepted errors are assailed, condemn this work straight away. Do not read it, let it cease to exist for you. But at the same time do not cry it down as dangerous. The secrets which it records will be understood by an elect few and will be reserved by those who understand them. Show light to the birds of the night time, and you hide their light, it is the light which blinds them and for them is darker than darkness. It follows that I shall speak clearly and make known everything, with the firm conviction that initiates alone, or those who deserve initiation, will read all and understand in part. Your time has come. For the essence of God is what keeps us alive, that pure energy source as discussed by quantum physics. It is imperative at this time that we develop discernment, the ability to discern what is right for us, to listen to our heart and to feel to go with our intuitive guidance. What a lot of us are now doing or becoming aware of the necessity of doing is really learning to listen to the Christ within, to open up to the inner teacher, to open up to our inner guidance. And um, the way you do that is, again, simply aligning to the energy that sustains you through breath work, through light work, through conscious awareness and mind mastery. Once you are in that space of timelessness, once you are in that space of nowness, this nowness, the present moment, is something that once you enter into that space, there is no time. There is nothing. There is just you, just being. You need to meditate on the present moment. Just focus entirely on the present moment. Bring your awareness to the present moment. Focus on your breathing and do not think of anything that's you, that you're going to do in the next moment. Do not think of anything that is in the past. Just think of the present moment. Just be in the present moment. A lot of people have unconscious altars in their homes, you know, you go look on the mantelpiece and there's a doily with grandma's picture and a lamp and some water, some perfume or something. And they don't realize that it is the longing for ritual, ritual space that they are doing there. Once it is brought to consciousness that you need and want ritual, then it becomes all about orchestrating your relationship to the energies that are in force at the time. I think I need to clarify uh, that. We unfortunately live in a culture where we fool ourselves into thinking that we are in dominant willful control. Okay. Um, I often uh, see people talking about commanding the universe. I don't think so. It's not about commanding. It is about energetically putting yourself in tune with the energies that are in force in nature, you know. So you do things by the moon by the cycles of the human body of life and of nature in order to be in accord and this is this is done through uh the orchestration of symbols you know and when you learn how to do that you are moving energy in the electromagnetic field that we all live in in such a way that you can traverse the landscape much easier. People have learned that it's better to sit down and meditate first before taking an action, okay? If you learn to sit down and meditate, recognize the symbols that are at work in your consciousness and arrange them in a harmonious fashion what what we have to do in this culture is recover from an overemphasis on the shadow side of it. it it's really it's really uh, overcoming post traumatic uh, distress disorder after the Inquisition. I want to say that very clearly. 
okay. Western culture is suffering from post-traumatic distress of the Inquisition when all of the natural tendencies, the relationship to nature, the relationship to the erotic, the relationship to village life, all of that was declared blasphemous, uh, unholy, and people were killed because of it, okay? So the only way that, that, that Western culture could come out from under the tyranny of the church was to, in, to claim absolute detached scientific thinking became, as uh, Houston Smith says, fundamentalist scientism, okay? And in fundamentalist scientism, the entire uh, intuitive faculty of a person is shut down or ignored or denied. But from my point of view, intuition, which connects us to spirituality, is the human extension of the mammalian survival instinct. Animals can smell better than us, see further than us, hear clearer than us, make other sounds that we can't hear, run faster than us, have fur and teeth and nails and stuff that we don't have that helps them to survive. For us, it is our intuition that informs every sense, sense of touch, smell, sight, sound. When that, when that, when Claire is added to it, we are better able to survive. It's that, that other thing that we have been given. What happens is when you study a number of traditions and you understand the universe behind that, your consciousness is filled with the kind of information where you automatically can understand where the boundaries are and deal with them. I always tell people there is a difference between inspiration and whim. What is difficult in this day and time is that we now have so much information available not always from reliable sources. Now I'm talking about Wikipedia and other places like that where anybody can go on and upload anything that they think, any whim that they have about something spiritual. And then somebody else can pick that up, pick up that misinformation and think that they have the right thing and incorporate it uh, ask you, you know, uh, there because in the past priesthoods have been oppressive for people, there is a tendency to either just make something up and not invest in or respect necessarily the people who have done something over and over and over for years and have had a lot, of, a lot of experience with it. You cannot just attend a workshop one weekend or read a couple of books and jump up and call yourself a healer because when people do that, the people they service get hurt. You know what I'm saying? And so for the person who's starting out, I say the two most dangerous things is the combination of ignorance and arrogance. If you know that you, if you are arrogant, you're too arrogant to, uh, you need humility enough to say, I don't know everything. You know what I'm saying? I, I bump up against what I don't know every day. But if you can, without loss of, of, uh, self say I don't know everything I am teachable then you can say 
my ignorance will be overcome by information. But I've met people who are both ignorant and arrogant about their ignorance, and they usually hurt themselves and somebody else, you know. So that's the thing. Oftentimes, the person who is really humble is the one who will receive the greatest inspiration because they have no ego investment in it, and spirit will speak to them very, very clearly. There is a lot that a person can do to speed this process up, and that is again through choice, through consciousness, through where we are choosing to align our focus, to align our energies. So the Merkabah is another name for your body of light. The creation of the light body is happening naturally. We are going through a huge shift in consciousness. It's obvious on the physical plane and it's obvious within the physical bodies of mankind. We're going to talk about the goddess Isis and your bar body, your heart soul, your eternal heart soul, the part in you that loves and only loves, the part of you that longs to fly to universal consciousness which from which from whence you come the part of you like the goddess isis that sorrows and searches through life to find the dismembered fragments of your own spiritual union and it's that journey in you it's that journey in you that takes us there it, the journey is part of the union the dismemberment is part of the journey. The goddess Isis, the most powerful and noble queen, the, the ruler of magic and healing, the most powerful magician in the pantheon, she loses her beloved lord. And she goes like a, into, a, into a raving mad rage, tearing her hair and lamenting like a mad woman. This proud and noble queen gives way to the most powerful grief and then calms down and goes on this long and lengthy quest, aided by her dark sister, to gather up the dismembered pieces of her lord. And this is what we do in life, the immortal soul that returns in every lifetime containing the imprint and the essence of your truest self, choosing different bodies, choosing different circumstances, choosing different parents, choosing different cultures, but always returning to its own truth and always taking that truth to the divine. And this is your eternal soul, your bar body, and if you look at the trials and the tribulations and the mighty achievements and powers of the goddess Isis, all of these can be yours from your own soul. The two sisters, Shadow and Soul, Kaibit and Ba, united in their quest for integration and self-sovereignty and divine marriage. And so this is your Isis consciousness. I'm going to take you from um, your highest spiritual essence to shed light upon your shadow. The goddess Nut has two daughters. And these two daughters ruled together with their husbands the land of Egypt. There was a bright daughter 
Isis. And there was a dark daughter, Nephthys. These are the dark and bright queens of our life and existence. From this lovely high perspective of the stellar goddess Nut and mother of the queens, the queen mother of the gods, we're going to shed light on the dark queen today, the goddess Nephthys, the lady of shadows and allurement and concealment and sorcery, the recognition that you have that power and that part of you must embrace and recognize that power in, in order to take you to your brightest and most strongest self. It's only by shedding light on the fears and resistances do we really come to the light of our own truth. And so, from the perspective of the goddess Nut, from your highest spiritual light body, shed your light on your own naughty daughter, the daughter that wants to hide from you and make concealments. But the most lovely thing about the goddess Nephthys, even though she was dark queen and married to the dark lord set, her whole essence in life was in the service of light. She chooses light over the darkness, and although she's married to the dark forces of the material world, she's in love with Osiris and with Isis. We only go into the shadow so that we can release ourselves into the soul. The goddess Isis chooses her sister beyond everything. Once um, Isis loses her beloved lord, Osiris, Nephthys springs to her aid and support. And so to embrace the shadow will only lead you to the soul. And when you claim the goddess Nephthys, the power of concealment and allurement, recognizing your own mystery, and having free will to tap in to the rich, fertile forces of your own imaginings. Your life becomes a much richer and more creative place. You're able to give more compassion and you'll be able to feel more empowered in the world. So recognize your shadow, embrace your shadow and love the mystery of the goddess Nut within you. Hathor is the goddess as woman. Hathor is the goddess manifested in human form. The priestesses of Hathor in ancient Egypt were trained from very early age in the arts of music and dance and healing as temple arts and on great festivals they would come out amongst the people and dance, actually manifesting the goddess for the people. So Hathor manifests herself through your divine humanity. The goddess Hathor is the goddess of love, of beauty, of aesthetics, of civilization, culture, relationships, the absolutely a perfect refinement of beauty that lay at the heart and core of all Egyptian civilization. And this um, beauty was consciously arrived at. It was a mark of divine respect to manifest beauty in every way that you could, in appreciation of the divine principles. So, as Hathor, as your energy of Isis, your bar body, informs your thoughts, ideas, personality, sense of self, from the truth of your own heart and the power of your own quest, when it reaches your personality and sense of self, your car body, which is your protective, magnetic, truthful force field, that shimmering cloak of iridescent light that is in perfect shape and alignment of your physical body, 
will be shining, that it will be imbued with your sense of yourself as a divine, truthful manifestation of heaven and earth. And this is Hathor consciousness, consciousness of your choices and your preferences and your aesthetics. The grace and beauty of your body held in its most conscious and comfortable deportment. Grace and balance, harmony and peace. This is what you have in the High Priestess. It's the power of the feminine, the intuition and the creation. And it says, don't be afraid to go into your darkness because that's where your creativity is. And you're creative, everybody is. Whether you be feminine or masculine, whether you're female or man, you have, you have that energy inside of you. She's really the basis of all shamanic work, all over the world, all through time. All shamans are participating in the transformation mystery and all the shamanic healing, whether it's tribal culture, or whether it's ancient culture, or whether it's um, happening in the United States today, is participating in her realm. Yeah. Well, she has a very dynamic presence in the ancient cultures, in um, the cultures that Rianne Eisler defines as partnership cultures, or what feminists have called matriarchal times. She lives in those times in, in the art and in the artifacts. There's actually um, a disappearance of her icons for 5,000 years, more or less, and she goes underground. And the way that she's come through the last 5,000 years has been a little bit more morbid and repressed and a little more demonic. She's actually been equated with the demonic because of her repression and because of her suppression. But before that, you see her vividly in ancient um, cultures from all over the world. She represents a very deep force of transformation and change, and the last 5,000 years have been a time of trying to pretend that there is no such thing, that, there, that things are linear, that they go along and, and don't have a cyclic reality. Really look at the whole um, feminine archetype through the polar opposites of the female cycle. So there's the ovulation period and there's the bleeding time. And the ovulation period represents, is represented by all the light goddesses or the nurturing mother goddesses. And the dark goddess represents the menstrual pole, and she's what's been repressed for 5,000 years. So I think in the ancient times it's pretty clear that women as a community bled together, mm -hmm. and that that alone was very powerful because it's a very psychically open time. And so if you can imagine all of us in a village or a tribe bleeding together, being open at the same time psychically to new information, to the future, to past lives, to all the kinds of um, beliefs that uh, were held by the ancient people, that we could open to um, phenomena from the spirit world at those times, which is shamanic work, that we would be um, really natural vessels for shamanic healing power and for shamanic information to come through for the community where we're seeing that the basis of our power, the core of the power, is through the biological mysteries, and that birthing and bleeding and the incredible kundalini power that's available to women through those actions is um, available to us, even in modern times, and there's a resurgence of that kind of awakening energy in all women on the planet right now. I think that a lot of the group ritual work and group power that we know the ancients possessed, even the power to move stones, through sound and through group energy. I think that kind of power w is available to us when we bleed and when we give birth. The blood cycle is a source of um, real deep female authority, which is exactly. what's missing from our world. And the first blood at the altar, this is documented now, the first blood at the altar was menstrual blood. Women giving their blood at the altar in a regular, natural, routine way um, and using that sacred power magically in the community for governing that old authority was lost with the menstrual taboo, with the changeover. And when the blood that women gave freely without death um, was taken away and women weren't priestesses any longer and men became priests, they had to get blood from somewhere. And it's the beginning of sacrifice. So there's an ethics to this that's very clear cut. And I think when we take back our blood cycle in a sacred way that each individual woman contributes to peace on earth because I think that if we were all bleeding together and really acknowledging and honoring that, there wouldn't be bloodshed 
all over the earth um, because there's some way the blood needs earth magically. It's a mystery. They evoke and they remind us and they actually awaken us to memories that we hold in our bodies and that otherwise have been erased from our history books and so on. So no matter how the archaeologists and the anthropologists interpret the ancient images, if you look directly at them, you get a different message. You know, in the ancient times, the goddess Inanna was the, is the first shaman. She's the first mm -hmm. literature that we know of, and she went to the underworld voluntarily in order to surrender her ego, to be transformed, to become a new, to have a new identity, to become a new self. And then after her is all the heroic epics, and the hero goes to the underworld to meet the same dark goddess, but he goes there with a sword to kill her, and he dismembers her, and that's the beginning of history and the end of the world in terms of the goddess religion. And I feel that ever since then, we, all of us, men and women, have been in a process of um, attempting to eradicate any kind of instinct from our lives, as if the instinctual process were equated with the demonic. She's in a receptive and an active state. She's actually listening for instructions. She's actually listening to the spirit world for advice and guidance and direction. And she's reading the signs. That little goddess on the, on the post is a signpost, you know, an oracular omen giver so that she'll know which path to take. We must make conscious decisions to move towards what we see, to move in relation to what we know. And that's the hard part. That's the part that requires empowerment and that requires grounding and that requires some, some internalized sense of authority, that I actually am a capable human being, capable enough to make the next decision about my life, even if the culture around me doesn't approve. We are literally cells in her body, but that power can come into our bodies and into our psychic systems. And if, we, if it comes in and we don't hold it, then we go crazy or we act out or we become, you know, obsessed with something. It comes through a particular channel. But if we can hold it, then it grows and it rises and it turns into something other than just its pure um, potency. And so if at first you feel rage, for example, which mm -hmm. many women do, sure. you can transmute that. That becomes fuel. That moves right into creativity. I think our task in these times as women is to embody the energies of the goddess, that the goddess is a force that exists in what's called the eternal yes. or that exists you know, somewhere in the unseen real, but that if we want to bring her into the world, which is being asked of us, I think, we have to embody her, individual women and groups of women, you know, have to embody her, bring her through, give her face, give her some kind of an expression. How can I trust you? Bingo. It is a pickle, no doubt about it. Bad news is there's no way if you can really know whether I'm here to help you or not. So it's really up to you. Just have to make up your own damn mind to either accept what I'm going to tell you or reject it. Candy? Do you already know if I'm going to take it? Wouldn't be much of an oracle if I didn't. I thought you'd have figured that out by now. Why are you here? Same reason. I love candy. But why help us? We're all here to do what we're all here to do. I'm interested in one thing, Neo, the future. And believe me, I know, the only way to get there is to get there. We all have unique and individual roles. Basically, I think we've come to understand that the new millennium, the golden age, is not going to occur through some angelic force stepping down from heaven, waving a magic wand and transforming the planet. This change will come about through a shift in conscious awareness, through a change in our own individual perception. And many of us are now working to bring this change into fruition. The main commitment that we have now is to simply allow our being to be so perfectly in tune with divine will. I guess all changes come from cleaning up your own backyard and through simply allowing the inner light to really shine forward. The female, the mother is the first teacher. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, a, a female, she can't teach no man how to be a man. Let me explain something to you. If the creator 
and the universe gave her the responsibility of allowing both to come from her body, she's more than qualified to teach both of them. She wouldn't have been given that responsibility. She's more than qualified. But she's not supposed to be in competition with the man because she needs him too. Why does she need him? To protect, to provide protection, to be the provider. Okay, the man was to help me. You have to realize that her main function was the bringing forth of life. Not just any life. Not this crazy stuff we are putting on the planet today, these sea murders and these Snoopy dogs and little Bow Wows. That's not what she was put here to bring forth. She was put, for, put here to bring forth divine life that represented the supreme consciousness of the supreme all. She is the gateway uh, uh, to the spirit world, and the spirit world and the physical world interacts. The womb is sacred. And you have to realize that when you begin to treat the womb or the penis in a manner that's not sacred, you begin to bring forth vibrations and energies that are going to work negatively against you because it's all in the consciousness. And you have to realize that you were giving those tools for the bringing forth of divine life. See, these are powerful tools. And you were supposed to know that these were tools for the bringing forth of divine life. Okay, so you have a female now. She's bringing a child. She's depressed, low self-esteem. John John done left her. And she has to bring this child up on the planet by herself. And she feels betrayed and abandoned. So she, that, she's going to carry that scar a long time. She's, she's probably going to dump that on all the rest of the men that she have to deal with. <laughs> we call that baggage. But what I'm trying to show you is what this does to the child in the womb. Because what she now has placed this child at a disadvantage because she didn't put anything positive on the primordial being of that fetus. So when a child comes out, he's like uh, all shy and depressed, low self-esteem. Where did they get that from? Where did they get that from? They got a song that says she got it from her mama. But so you have to know that it works both ways. He can get it from his mama too. See, I didn't know my mother or my father. So a lot of what I had to learn, I had to learn my, on my own. But if I'd had that assistance early on, you see what I'm saying? There's no telling where I could have been. So you have to realize that your role is so, so very significant and important. And that when you abuse those roles, then you hurt whatever comes through you. And that's what the, I want the men to know, that your job is to be that helpmate and that support for the female. Uh, the female, if she feels like, oh, I'm superior to you because I got, you know, that down there. Well, see, her superiority is ain't because she got that down there. Her superiority is in her ability to bring forth life. That's it. You know, you can have that down there and be abusing it, you know in a very profane and corrupt way like you see a lot of sisters doing today. Okay, what she's going to do is bring judgment upon herself because the universal mother says that's a no-no. You were not created to use the sacred womb in such a corrupt manner and then to allow the man to have that imagery of you. Okay, you make all women look bad doing that. You know, because then they begin to view us in a very negative way way as opposed to a very spiritual and sacred way. See, it's our job to make sure that you see us in a very spiritual and sacred way. And the only way you're going to do that is how I carry myself. You know what I'm saying? I have to know myself in order for you to know yourself because you can only do what I allow you to do. So we're going to have to reshift our thinkings and get back in alignment because we are very, very out of alignment. Now many of us have become so Romanized, that's what I call America. See, you're not in America anymore. You are in the newly re-resurrected Roman Empire. If you didn't know it, you know it now. This is straight up Rome. And if you don't know anything about Rome, you need to go get you a quick history lesson. Rome was a very decadent and corrupt place. 
But see, they have eyes to see but can't see, and have ears to hear but can't hear, because they're spiritually dead. And see, the universe says that when you are spiritually dead, you dead. Now, some of you have been taught that death is being shoved into a casket and put in the ground, but that's not what the universe, the universe says that the first death starts spiritually, meaning your consciousness. When you have lost all consciousness of truth, all consciousness of what your purpose on the planet is supposed to be, the universe says you're dead. That means the ancestors can't talk to you. That means the royal family, the creator, they can't talk to you because you are so corrupted and you are so out of balance that the information that they may have for you, they're not going to deal with a corrupted vessel. Why should they impart their wisdom to you and you've made up your mind to be a Roman? So spiritual death is the first death. Physical death is the second death. That's when you actually get put into the ground. And the next death is where your consciousness or your soul goes back to where it went to, and now you have to be judged. And that judgment process will determine, okay, do you qualify to continue to exist or not? So that's where we're at now. And the universe says that everybody down here is spiritually, uh, uh, spiritually dead and that we're all out of balance. Now, some people may disagree with that, like, I ain't out of balance. Well, you are. The earth herself is out of balance. And it is the earth that sustains all life upon the planet. So if the earth herself is out of balance, you have to be out of balance, too. You got to be out of balance, too. And she's out of balance. You know, her air is polluted. Her seas and her rivers are polluted. The cutting down of the various trees, the defilement of the rainforest, uh, the overworking of the land, you know, everything has been infected with the laws of death. So the laws of death have been set into motion. And some of these, uh, 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 in, in, in most of our cases, we came from the room being taught the laws of death without even knowing it. You don't know the laws of life because if you knew them, you wouldn't be dying. And your children wouldn't be dying. So my purpose is to, to come to you and say, okay, what are the forgotten truths of the laws of life? Because whatever they are, we need to begin to practice them. The priestess is the Virgin Sophia first companion of the Creator, who channels and conveys authentic divine love into the world. This is also the sensitive soul of the mystique, male or female, who having entered the temple of the heart, waits expectingly for a revelation of the Goddess. We see the priestess, or Pappas, draw life force up her left side, the ascending pillar, father pillar, the, harmonizing it with the cosmos around her crown, then pouring it out along the descending mother pillar, through her right breast and hand feeding the sublunar realm with her heavenly light. The two candlesticks with their twining vines demonstrate that all the earth is the priestess altar. What I want you to try and do now is to imagine, try and imagine a world in which the good versus evil problem is non-existent. Try and imagine a world where people simply do not think in those terms. 
try and imagine a world where the closest thing you get to the good versus evil thing is the difference between what is wanted and what is not wanted. And then realize that what is wanted or not wanted simply depends on who you are and where you are in life at any given moment. And thus the distinction is fluid and cannot be compared to good versus bad thinking at all. Now, try and imagine that kind of world and that state of mind. And then try not to judge whether that is a good or a bad thing. It is difficult, I know, but try and the closer you get to imagining what that kind of mind and that kind of world would be like, the closer you're getting to the mind and world of our pagan ancestors. Almost certainly, N. Hadouana would have been a medium. It suddenly dawned on me one day that what was going on in the sacred marriage was a, a case of possession. Priests and priestesses dress like their deity because they are stating that they are the deity. For the purposes of the Ur society, N. Hadouana would have been Ningal on earth. That's why she's called goddess on earth. Nin Dingir. What happens when a woman, a medium, is possessed by a spirit? That spirit is there, absolutely vividly there, and the people can talk to that spirit. The woman's voice talks. Women who are used to being possessed by deities, in Korea, for instance, and in China, and in the Candomblé in Brazil, the Afro-American religion in Brazil, they can get possessed just like that, just fall into trance. I think that as long as she's in that hat, she's dressed as high priestess of Nana. She's not incorporating a goddess. The minute she has the hat on her head with the horns, she is a goddess. She couldn't go around incorporating the goddess all the time. It's totally exhausting. It takes some of these women days to recover. They had a way of indicating that she had done it and was able to do it again. And one of the signs was the hat with the rolled brim. So that when people met her, they met someone who had been goddess and will be goddess again. So they treated her specially. The minute she incorporates goddess, she dresses as Ningal. One of the things that is a regular royal inscription is uh, the installation of an end priestess. It, it will say the year the end priestess of Nana was installed. And they happened once in a while, but they were so significant that they were used to mark years. The interesting thing about Frain is he's a Sumerologist at the University of Toronto, and he's doing work on the royal inscriptions on Mesopotamia, and he'll have an administrative document from a temple which says, acquired one lady's bed, acquired one lady's throne, acquired spreads for the bed, and so on. His article argues that the sacred marriage was used for the installation of an end priestess, and that would make some sense, because she was the representation of the wife of the deity, Nana. Hedwana is probably a name given to her on her ordination. We don't know her actual birth name. It means N, the N, Hedu, the ornament, the ornament of heaven. Inanna is the, the participant in the sacred marriage. Inanna is love and lust personified. And in Judeo-Christian 
theology, we tend to think of love and lust as very separate, and lust isn't very good, and love is fine, but it should be more abstract and more mental. In antiquity, love and lust were merged, and the sex act was a very wonderful, loving, procreative, society-healing act. Modern religions, in fact, for many centuries, have failed to explain the sexual mysticism or the sexual symbolism hidden in this ancient story. And this is much to the detriment of this world. Because, in fact, an in-depth understanding of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is precisely the doorway out of suffering. It is the doorway back to Eden. Fallen humanity can return back to a state of happiness, a state of ecstasy or bliss, which in Hebrew is Eden. The word Eden literally means bliss or pleasure. And this again points out to us that the Garden of Eden and the story of the Tree of Knowledge must have something to do with sex. Da'at, this doorway of knowledge, can lead to good or evil, tob or ra. We have further evidence that knowledge or to know is sexual by the use of the word knowledge in the Bible. There are many cases where we find, for example, and Adam knew his wife, and she begat Cain. Or when Mary said to the angel, How can this be that I should have a child when I have not known any man? Many cases like this. So knowledge implies a sexual knowledge. We do not study this just for the sake of theory or because it's interesting. We study this because we're tired of suffering. We study this because we want a fundamental change in our experience of life. We want a fundamental change in our experience of death. We want to know. There is a secret knowledge that occurs or that is available between man and woman. It's this knowledge of Da'at. And it's very strange that so many religions now reject the union of man and woman. And for centuries have said that a person needs to be alone, to be a so-called celibate. Which is nowhere demonstrated in the Bible or in any religion, except when Paul was explaining some very subtle things, which are greatly misunderstood. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, it says in Genesis. This river proceeding out of the secret place of the Most High never ceases to flow down upon the world or the garden as it's termed. This secret place of its origin or fount is symbolized by Bet, the first letter in the book of Genesis. It includes in itself all the other letters and symbolizes also the river which gives life to all things. The secret place resembles a narrow path, most difficult to discover and walk therein, yet be studded with many priceless gems. The secret place is sex. And that river that emerges out of Eden, Eden means bliss. That river is that energy of sex. That energy is what creates all life. It gives life to all things. And that secret place resembles a narrow path most difficult to discover, which is, of course, the narrow path that Jesus pointed out. Enter in ye by the narrow gate. Difficult to find, he says. That narrow gate is that. And this is another very interesting thing about our psychology. Many people are very spiritual, except when it comes to sex. Many people love Jesus or Krishna or Buddha, but don't want to think about Jesus or Buddha or Krishna when they're in the bedroom. 
Why? God made sex. Why should we be ashamed of it? We're ashamed of it because we know in our heart of hearts that we abuse it. That's why. We know that through eating the forbidden fruit, through the emission or ejaculation, those energies are cast out of the body. When they are retained, those fires are retained. And this is the basis of Taoism, Tantra, and Dat. These traditions that hold that force and transform it and utilize it. It's not necessary to memorize all of this. What's necessary is to do the work. And that work is daily and moment to moment. The fire that emerges within us is a sexual fire, but it's also a psychological fire because we manipulate those forces with our use of willpower. We do the work from moment to moment, no matter our circumstances, no matter our station in life, no matter our difficulties or limitations. If you have a physical body and you have a consciousness, you can work. So Da'at, the doorway of knowledge, is within us, not outside. In ancient rites, on lonely hills or in the forest dark, we praise the Magna Mater, her tree and sacred bark. Gracious Goddess, show me the way to that abiding inner tranquility which endures through any hardships of physical life. The god represents the most spiritual form of Isis the Eternal Virgin, the Artemis of the Greeks. She is clothed only in the luminous veil of light. It is important for high initiation to regard light not as the perfect manifestation of the Eternal Spirit, but rather as the veil which hides that spirit. It does so all the more effectively because of its incomparably dazzling brilliance. The tradition of the best schools of Hindu mysticism has a precise parallelism. The final obstacle to full enlightenment is exactly this vision of formless effulgence. Thus she is light and the body of light. She is the truth behind the veil of light. She is the soul of light. In this card is the one link between the archetypal and formative worlds. Thus far concerning this path, considered as issuing downwards from the crown, but to the aspirant, this is the path which leads upwards, and this card, in one system entitled the Priestess of the Silver Star, is symbolic of the thought, or rather of the intelligible radiance, of that angel. It is, in short, a symbol of the highest initiation. Now it is a condition of initiation that its keys are to be communicated by those who possess them to all true aspirants. It is important to reflect that this card is wholly feminine, wholly virginal, for it represents the influence and the means of manifestation, or, from below, of attainment, in itself. It represents possibility in its second stage without any beginning of consummation. Purity is to live only to the highest, and the highest is all, be thou as Artemis to Pan. Break through the veil of the Virgin. Pure, exalted and gracious influence enters the matter. Hence, change, alternation, increase and decrease, fluctuation. There is, however, a liability to be led away by enthusiasm, one may become moonstruck unless careful balance is maintained. But perhaps it would be better, first of all, to build on a sure foundation by consideration of the number two. There are only two operations possible in the universe, analysis and synthesis. To divide, and to unite. Solvetico Aguila, said the alchemists. If anything is to be changed, either one must divide one object into two parts, or add another unit to it. This principle lies at the basis of all scientific thought and work. The ancients were fully cognizant of this idea, the Chinese, in particular, based their whole philosophy on this primary division of the original nothing. One must begin with nothing, otherwise the question would arise, whence came this postulated something? The possibility of form. This first and the most spiritual manifestation of the feminine takes to itself a masculine correlative, by formulating in itself any geometrical point from which to contemplate possibility. 
This virginal goddess is then potentially the goddess of fertility. She is the idea behind all form, as soon as the influence of the triad descends below the abyss, there is the completion of concrete idea. This desert is the abyss wherein is the universe. The stars are but thistles in that waste. Yet this desert is but one spot accursed in a world of bliss. Now and again travelers cross the desert, they come from the great sea, and to the great sea they go. And as they go they spill water, one day they will irrigate the desert, till it flower. Giving the idea of heaven and earth in perfect balance, the sun and the moon in imperfect balance, and the four elements in unbalanced form. The sun may be clouded, yet ever the sun will sweep on its course till the cycle is run. And when to chaos the system is hurled, again shall the builder reshape a new world. Your path may be clouded, uncertain your goal, Move on, for your orbit is fixed to your soul. And though it may lead into darkness of night, the torch of the builder shall give it new light. You were, you will be, know this while you are. Your spirit has traveled both long and afar. It came from the source, to the source it returns. The spark which is lighted eternally burns. It's left in a jewel, it's left in a wave, it roamed in the forest, it rose from the grave, it took on strange gods for long eons of years, and now in the soul of yourself it appears, from body to body your spirit speeds on, it seeks a new form when the old one has gone, and the form that it finds is the fabric you wrought, on the loom of the mind, from the fibre of thought. As dew is drawn upwards in rain to descend, your thoughts drift away and in destiny blend. You cannot escape them, for petty or great, or evil or noble, they fashion your fate. Somewhere on some planet, some time and somehow, your life will reflect your thoughts of your now. My law is unerring, no blood can atone. The structure you built, you will live in alone. From cycle to cycle, through time and through space, your lives with your longings will ever keep pace. And all that you ask for, and all you desire, must come at your living as flame out of fire. Once listen to that voice, and your tumult is done. Your life is the life of the infinite one. In the hurrying race, you are conscious of pause, with love for the purpose and love for the cause. You are your own devil, you are your own god. You fashion the path that your footsteps have trod, and no one can save you from error or sin until you have heart to the spirit within. Divination is simply the knowledge of effects contained in causes and science applied to the facts of the universal dogma of analogy. Human acts are not written in the astral light alone, their traces are left upon the face, they modify mien and carriage, they change the tone of the voice. Thus every man bears about him the history of his life, which is legible for the initiate. Now, the future is ever the consequence of the past and unexpected circumstances do not appreciably alter results reasonably calculated. The destiny of each man can be therefore foretold him. An entire existence may be judged by a single movement. Initiation is a preservative against the false lights of mysticism, it equips human reason with its relative value and proportional infallibility, connecting it with supreme reason by the chain of analogies. Hence the initiate knows no doubtful hopes, no absurd fears, because he has no irrational beliefs, he is acquainted with the extent of his power, and he can be bold without danger. He knows. He dares. And is silent. As we can see, there is a need to balance the male and female energies, to create complete balance and harmony. 
the energy that sustains us, that God essence, is androgynous. And we actually have, in fact, masculine and feminine expression of energy within us. A lot of people now are being guided to balance those energies within so that they are more whole, more complete in their expression instead of just being particularly female or playing a role as society has dictated. In other words, there's nothing a woman can't do, there's nothing a man can't do, that we come from a point when we relate to each other of complete balance and wholeness. Everything we experience is in the field of time and space. In the field of time and space, things are broken up into separate things. So what we experience is separateness within the womb of the mother. The mother is time and space and causality. But then we have another mother image that occurs after the rise of cities. You see goddesses with on the, the crown on their heads are the walls of a city. The walled city is our mother, the mother of our civilization, the mother of our life. The culture as our mother culture. So, the image of God, the name of God, is in the field of the mother, which gives names and forms. All of this comes to you, and your mother then, as the representative of this mothering principle. Again, in the Orient, the word for energy, Shakti, is female. Energy is the female principle. Joyce uses it this way also. The female is the awakener of your energies. The male is at peace with himself. And this shining, twinkling invitation goes by, and he is activated. So she is the activator. For mine is the ecstasy of the spirit, and mine also is joy upon earth. For my law is love unto all beings. Keep pure your highest ideal, strive ever towards it. Let not stop you or turn you aside. For mine is the secret which opens upon the land of use, and mine is the cup of the wine of life, the cauldron of Keridwin, which is the holy grail of immortality. I am the gracious goddess who gives the gift of joy unto the heart of man. Upon earth I give the knowledge of the spirit eternal, and beyond death I give peace and freedom and reunion with those who have gone before. Nor do I demand sacrifice, for behold, I am the mother of all living, and my love is poured out upon the earth. And then the priest says, Hear ye the words of the star goddess, she in the dust of whose feet are the hosts of heaven, and whose body encircles the universe. And the priestess answers, I, I, who am the beauty of the green earth and the white moon amongst the stars, and the mystery of the waters and the desire of the heart of man, call unto thy soul, arise, and come unto me, for I am the soul of nature who gives life to the universe. From me all things proceed, and unto me all things must return. And before my face, beloved of gods and of men, let thine innermost divine self be enfolded in the rapture of the infinite. Let my worship be within the heart that rejoiceth. For behold, all acts of love and pleasure are my rituals. And therefore, let there be beauty and strength, power and compassion, honor and humility, <coughs> mirth and reverence within you. And thou who thinkest to seek for me, know thy seeking and yearning shall avail thee not, unless thou knowest the mystery, that if that which thou seekest, thou findest not within thee, then thou wilt never find it without thee. For behold, I have been with thee from the beginning, and I am that which is attained at the end of desire. Here, initiate 
You are reborn. Go back to the world you know and know yourself. Fear nothing, especially darkness. It was your home in the womb, and it is the night sky that holds you in sleep as the light of the day hides the stars from your sight. Imagination and wisdom and intuition are all. Use them wisely and with love. سوار بر شطور در میان کبیر مرا جستجو کردی از دروازه سرطان همچون نور ماه روی آب مرا پیدا کردی آنچه که در من جستجو می کنی تو خود می دانی. باید به معبد من با روح اوریان نزدیک شوی اگر با فروتنی و بیریان از زمنایی من الهه وحی و راهنمای تو به سمت چاکرای تاج خواهم بود جایی که با الوهیت و نیستی پیوند دوباره خواهی داشت تنها از طریق جدایی است که سعادت تجربه پیوند دوباره از داد را خواهی داشت من تفاوت‌ها را آشکار می‌سازم <تصفيق> 